was made complete or it is finished. So it would have been incomplete until by that work or action he offered his son up for a sacrifice. Does that make sense? So it's not like you're doing it by a law. You're not doing things because a law says to or someone tells you to. You're doing it because you love God. And according to John 14, 15, if you love me, you do what I say. Okay? So people that say, oh, I love God, and then I see how they live, they're deceived. True love is not an emotion. True love is an action. Okay? And so Abraham was justified by his works, not faith only. See, that blows me away. Now, the least translation of, if you love me, keep my commandments. Listen to this. If you are loving me, continuous action, with a divine and self-sacrificial love, the commandments which are mine, you will keep. True God love is self-sacrificial. Whenever your flesh wants to rise up and say something that's wrong to someone, you will kill that. You will sacrifice that because you know that God, that, would, that wouldn't please them. But divine love only comes from God. A sinner cannot possess it. So first you must have that divine love, and then that love literally empowers you to do what God wants you to do. Does that make sense? So you're not trying to do it in your own strength. You're merely accessing that powerful love. And the Bible says that faith and love work together. And God told me to tell you guys this. God will always demand faith from you. Always. He will never, ever, ever let you get away from it. Because faith is what pleases Him. Faith is required to even go to heaven. You know what I mean? And so He wanted you guys to know that if you want to get out from under the test of faith, you're out of luck. <laughs> That's the good news. All right. Now, get this, scientists, now this is incredible. Molecular scientists have traced the decision and thought processes of humans to two emotions. Anybody know them? Love and hate. Anybody else? Love and fear. Molecularly, on a cellular level, it comes down to love and fear. So that means whenever you're making a decision, you know, because your heart first, then they actually follow, your mouth speaks and you follow, okay. Whenever you make a decision to action, you are either doing it out of love or you're doing it out of fear. Alcoholism is fear-based. Drug addiction is fear-based. Depression, anxiety, bipolar, they're fear-based. It's not understanding Love, And what they've also found is a human body and the brain was never made to possess fear. We weren't wired to possess fear. It was because of the fall. And in fact, a lot of scientists recognized there had to be a God. We were literally made to love. And because of the fall, we had to battle for that. All sin, all manifestation of sin is a result of one thing, unbelief. And unbelief comes from fear. And all obedience is a result of love. And you may not be 100% every time. That's okay. We have a mediator, and he intercedes for us. Now, in verse 7, it says, They're seeking, looking for, and striving to find glory, honor, and immortality in eternal life. So like I was telling you guys earlier, it's a byproduct of having an, an eternal view. But get this, have any of you guys ever read the book or heard of the book Slide Edge? Okay, Christy has, I think Roberta, you might have had it in your package. Mm -hmm. Slide Edge, here's the deal. Christy, can you come up here and, and put your hands like, like this? Okay, so imagine that you've got a person on the top that is making 
little decisions every day to improve themselves, okay? And then you have people here that represent those that are making little decisions every day that do not improve themselves. And so as you go, just picture this line, as you go for years and even decades, they're on the same level. So you see someone that maybe up here, they're uh, eating right, exercising, putting money away in savings, reading personal development books. And then you have people down here that are reading romance novels, sitting on the couch most of the time, eating donuts, and their exercise is getting up to get another donut, okay? So you have these two people, and they continue, and there's no visible change in the gap. And then all of a sudden, years and years and years of making the right decisions, they begin to propel themselves up, and these begin to go down even to death. The problem, thank you, the problem with a slight edge is it's easy to do it and easy not to do it. It's easy not to read your Bible, and it's easy to read it. It's easy not to pray, and it's easy to. It's easy to get along with other people and build and work on relationships, and it's also easy not to. And so we have to understand that who you are today is the sum of every single decision you have made. Now, some might say, well, I was molested as a child. I was abused. How can you say that? I didn't ask for that to happen. But how did you choose to respond? No one has the power over you to form you into the person you are unless you give them permission. Do you understand? No one, the abusive stepmoms, all the stuff I went through, drug abuse, alcohol abuse in my life, it is improper for me to say that those things formed me into who I am today. What formed me into who I am today is the choices I made. You know, um, someone that's close to me has a friend that was, basically both of them were treated wrong as teenagers at a, a church. And uh, since then, this one girl has decided she's an atheist. Doesn't believe in God. Well, it's really ridiculous because your unbelief or belief in him doesn't change his existence. But anyway, so she's decided that. Well, this person that was close, that is close to me said that she told her, you know, Sherry has been basically ran out of the church. Letters have been sent out about her. She's been mistreated. And I can't remember exact, the exact words, but basically she's chosen to continue to follow God because God is not those people. And so it doesn't matter what people do to you until you give them permission to affect you. Okay? Someone needed to hear that. So don't allow people that power. Now, in Matthew 25, 21, listen to this. A person that lives by the slight edge and with a view toward eternity they um, pursue everything with excellence and they're faithful. In Matthew 25, 21, his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. How you take care of things on this earth will determine the reward you encounter in heaven, okay? Now, here's an even greater truth. How you take care of other people's things will determine your reward in heaven. I don't know if you guys know this, but whenever, I'm always looking for leaders. Um, I don't believe that just one person should run the show. We should think generationally. We should think kingdom. And you know what I look for? Are y'all curious? I don't look at whether they can speak in tongues or prophesy or heal the sick. I don't look at any of that. I look at how they treat the waitress at the restaurant. I look at how if I hire them for a job, 
Do they do it well? I look at how they treat their spouse or their parents. I look at how they treat one another. Because if they don't have enough excellence to treat other people's things and those in their lives well, then they do not have excellence to be a leader. And I will hold off on anything that I feel God is saying that they will be doing eventually. It's the practical things. Before any minister ever speaks here, I see how they treat people. Because I don't want people coming up here and teaching the word and they treat people that serve them at restaurants and stuff like poop. And so when I was meditating on this, the Lord told me, he said, if it means that much to you, how do you think I view it? Because what I'm giving into their care are my people. You know what I mean? And so not just everyone, when you see a minister that's truly anointed and that loves the Lord, they've paid a high cost. You know, and people don't want to hear about all they've paid. But they've paid a lot. And, and the only reason that God begins to promote is because they've learned to take care of their home and their vehicle and their relationships and all in their finances. And then the Lord's like, I can, I can trust my people too. Does that make sense to you guys? So everything you do is really important. And you know, a lack of excellence is actually laziness. I don't know if you guys know that. But to, you know, in any time I've gotten lazy and I just want to hurry up and get something done, I'm just tired of doing it, I don't want to do it, it's cost me something. It's either cost me pay, it's cost me a job, it's cost me relationships, whatever it is. If I get where I do not have excellence in any area of my life, I lose something. And then he says that they have patient continuance. Now listen to this. There's two kinds of patience in the Greek. There's a patience under people, and there's a patience under circumstances. Okay? So often God will send you a combination to do a work in you. Well, this patience means to persevere, remain under, bear up under, be patient, and endure as to things or circumstances. So it's being in that tight place financially. It's being in that annoying relationship. It's being in that thing or that circumstance where you wonder, is this ever going to change? And this patience always must be attached to hope and not wishful thinking. Well, I hope one day it changes. I don't know. My dying is still the same. Okay? We're not dealing with people. We're dealing with circumstances, right? Hope in the Greek mindset <coughs> is an expectation of good. In other words, have y'all, like, do you remember when you were kids and you couldn't wait for Christmas? Or your birthday? I still can't wait for my birthday. Anyway, it's like you have this expectation, I'm going to get some good stuff for Christmas. And I'll never forget one of my birthdays I was 12. It's burned in my memory. I probably need some healing. But there weren't any presents when I got home from school for my birthday. And I'm like, they forgot. I mean, I was devastated. You know, I get home from school before Dad and his wife get home. And... So then, to make matters worse, they, they said, well, your birthday present, we ordered it. It's not here yet. And they hand me a picture of it. And I thought, is this a cruel joke? Like, and I'm just staring at it. And I'm staring at them. I'm sure I had a look of disgust. Why? Because my expectation was basically dashed to the ground, stomped on, picked up, and thrown in the trash, you know. And then they were like, no, for real, we really do have it on the way. It was a stereo system, you know. Two cassette player, the whole nine yards, that's in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. And so later when I got it, I, but there was nothing like getting it on that day. You know what I mean? And so what happens is deferred hope. And so if you're not careful, disappointment, discouragement, it, and deferred hope will make you sick. And you'll get down and the enemy will begin to, you know, play with your mind and stuff. So you have to latch on to that hope. Latch on to it. Anchor your faith to it. Keep it before you. Don't give up. And it will happen. 
In verses 8 through 9, it says those that are self-seeking, they will only seek uh, for their own. They'll not obey the truth. The word truth is unveiled reality. It says that they will instead obey or follow unrighteousness, which means that's what is wrong. And the word indignation means to move impetuously. Impetuous is a person who commit acts rashly based on passion. In other words, it's those that just fly off the handle or react to things or make decisions in the midst of an emotional turmoil. And remember we talked about living out of the soul and living out of the spirit? You might want to write this down, but um, I'm going to tell you something really, really important, okay? When I learned this from mom and dad, and I was a teenager, it helped me so much. You ready? There are no emergencies with God. God's never uh, taken by surprise. He's never like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? There's no rushing around trying to fix stuff with Him. There's never any emergencies with God. And here's something else you guys need to know. Do not allow other people's emergencies to become yours. Well, that makes me feel stupid. <laughs> I know. I did too when I first heard it. It's okay. That thing has helped me so much in every aspect. Business, relationships. You know, there have been times where I've had people call me and God will say, don't answer it. They think there's an emergency. You know, because I want to answer. I want to see if they have, you know, like, how can I help? But you cannot be people driven. You know, you can't be need driven. And then sometimes people are like, well, why didn't you answer? I needed you, so I called someone else. Good, call someone else, because I'm going to do what God says. But sometimes we need to learn instead of running to the phone, you run to the throne, right? And so it doesn't mean that you negate getting counsel and help when you need it. Like if someone calls in the middle of the night and they have an emergency where maybe they've gotten a wreck or you know something's happened or demons have invaded your house and they're freaking out, yeah. But we're not going to immediately in our pajamas jump in the car and drive over, you know, raccoon night because your makeup's all <laughs> smeared. You know what I mean? We're going to get up, we're going to initially pray, and then we'll go over there as needed. Do you know people that don't have a lot of faith that drives them nuts? Nuts. I've had people say, does not anything bother you? Yep. In fact, you can ask Chrissy, me and Mike got a little tiff the other day. <laughs> I actually hung up on them. <laughs> and I told, I told Chrissy, I said, piece of marriage advice. When you tell your husband something, have him repeat it back to you because 90% of the time he did not hear what you said. <laughs> That's exactly what happened with my choice. You know, he's all frazzled and stuff because he had a lot on his plate, emergencies. And so I was like, whatever, click. <laughs> but anyway, we're good. We're good, though. But uh, so just understand that and don't allow people to draw you into their own emergencies because what will happen is they'll suck the life out of you. Okay? Now, come in here tonight for that. It will save you a lot of trouble. Even in business. I will not. I bet this old man is so funny. He's 91. And he'll call me and he'll say, when can you? come work on my computer. And he's hard of hearing on top of it. So I'm yelling, I can come Tuesday at 1. <laughs> what? I can come. I'm so like repeating myself right now. So then he goes, Thursday? Tuesday? Well, that's a week away. And then he'll say the D word. Um, and then he'll go, well, can't you come here sooner? It's an emergency. No, it's not. I'll be here Tuesday at 1. And so, sure enough, it drives them nuts. You know, it gives me a rough time. But it's like something like, you know, how do I delete an email? You know what I mean? It's like ridiculous. <laughs> so I've just learned, even in business relationships. Now, um, <laughs> funny, Christy. <laughs> So he, sa he says that impetuous people, they give no thought to how their actions affect others. They're just reacting out of their emotion. 
And then God also says that these can be wrathful people, like they're angry as a state of mind, but also fretful and discontent and annoyed. And so these are people that are moved basically by emotion. Now, Galatians 6, 8 says, He who sows the flesh will the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows the spirit will the spirit reap everlasting life. So what Paul wanted the, the Romans to know is it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. Okay? Everyone's going to receive the same justice because God is not partial. There's heresy that um, basically is in the church at some places where it says that just because a person's a Jew, they're saved. That's not the case. They must be born again. But then you have the other side of the heresy that says that God is done with Israel. That's not true either. And then he says, and we're finished with verses 12 through 16. In Romans 2. I'm so glad um, that scripture in Jeremiah where God says don't look at their faces. I've had people when you know, I've been ministering and you know, they're either they're annoyed looking or you know, tired looking or bored looking. And I would always be surprised if those people would come up and say, that really touched me. <laughs> I'm like, did I hear you snoring? Anyway. Okay. Romans 2.12. Now listen to this. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law, they will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law, these will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things that are in the law... These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who will show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or excusing themselves. For in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. What on earth is he saying? He's saying, if a Gentile has never heard the law, and they die not keeping the law, they're going to be judged too. And then you have maybe a Jew that's heard the law, you know, they've been raised in the law, then they're going to be judged by the law when they die or their deeds. So what he's saying is people have a law in themselves. When you were a kid, did you know it was wrong to lie to your parents? Did y'all know? How? Right. Some people, their conscience is more seared than others. They don't feel sin. But some people, the least little thing will bother them, you know. And they don't even have to be born again. Why? Because there's a law that's built within us that knows right from wrong. And so that's what makes the um, pushing that aside and not allowing it to have a work in us so that we know that we need the Lord is so dangerous. So basically all he's saying is that it doesn't matter whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, all are sinners. That's all he's saying, okay? A good example of a Jewish person that's a sinner are the religious leaders. They studied the law, they searched the scriptures, they were students of it, they taught it, they thought that in the law was eternal life, and when Jesus came, they did not recognize him. Now, they're not going to heaven because they're Jew. And their end was actually pretty bad on earth. So they had this principle that they heard the word and said they had faith, but they didn't have any action. Now, get this. This is the final thing. Matthew 22. Listen to this. Teacher, verse 36 or 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, they weren't asking him because they wanted to know. They were trying to trick him. Jesus said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is a first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now that is very important, that word hang, and I'll get to that in a second. But basically, the guy's coming up to him saying, hey, out of all the Old Testament law, which one is the greatest in the law of Moses? Now, Notice that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you don't love yourself, you're not going to love your neighbor. Okay, so that's just really important to get that out of the way. 
But he said, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. In other words, you love God, you love yourself, you love others in that order. That's how it has to happen, okay? If you do that, you won't lie. You won't steal. You won't cause problems. You won't do those things, right? Because you'll have this love. And then he says, the word hang, it literally means in the Greek, one who is hanged on a tree like a cross. So what the Lord was saying is that on me hang all the law and all the prophets. Everything summed up in me. Why? Because love allowed himself to be hung on a tree. Does that make sense? And so then he said, take up your cross, which should be a cross of love, not obligation, not legalism, but a cross where you're like, you know what? I accept the divine love you've given me, and I will sacrifice my own agenda, my own will, my own emotions, all of that, so that everything is fulfilled in my love for you. And so you see, it doesn't matter whether you've been raised in the law or not raised in the law, Jew or Gentile, it all comes down to one thing, and that's love. It all comes down to that, okay? So I want to pray for you guys, and I'll dismiss y'all, because y'all look like y'all had a rough week. My goodness. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that Jesus did hang himself and lay down his life on a tree to remove us from the curse. He nailed all the requirements of the law to that tree. And when he did that, he disarmed principalities and powers. And he made them a public spectacle. And so, Father, I pray that we begin to live by the two commandments. Love you, love ourselves, and love others from that place. I ask, Father, that you mold us into people of excellence based on that love that we, would, we have for you. And I pray, Father, that it begins to grow in us so that when your son returns, it doesn't matter if we've raised the dead. It doesn't matter if we've prophesied to millions. It doesn't matter if millions have been saved through the ministry that you've given us. But that, Father, we can say that one thing we did do, that was love. And so, Father, I ask that you give us a clear picture from the scriptures as to what that love looks like so that we don't mistake it for what culture tells us that it is. So, Father, I ask that every person in this place be blessed over this next week. I ask that your face shine upon them. I ask that they hear you singing over them in their dreams. I ask, Father, that you speak to them clearly and give them direction. And I ask that your favor rests upon everyone. We thank you, and we love you for your word, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if anyone wants ministry, we'll pray. But if you need to go, then adios, amigos. Can you turn